this in the, uh, the chapter 7 of Esther. Um, it's a kind of a short chapter. But not the shortest, the tenth chapter has got like three or four verses in it. It's crazy. But we're still going to cover that in a few weeks' time. And uh, next wow. week we've got Wes Bauer teaching Esther chapter 8, which is going to be awesome. Wow. Um, but we're going to jump straight into this, so let's get cleaned up here. Book of Esther. First section, verses 1 to 4, which is called the Second Banquet. Ufes, can you read verses 1 to 4, please? Yes, yeah, chapter 7, right? Yes, sir. Alright. Um... So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen, and the king said again unto Esther on the second day of the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And is and it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed, even to, to, the, even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given to me at, at my petition, and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bond, bondmen and bondwomen, I held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Awesome, thank you. Well, okay, we have to kind of start because it's kind of jumped straight into uh, the previous banquet. So. Esther had invited them to come to a banquet. There's a second banquet now. This is this one. It's called the Banquet of Wine. Pretty fancy. So, um, yeah, Esther puts on a second banquet with the king and Haman. Haman's been invited as well. Uh, and this question, what is your request? Esther came up and said, hey, king, I've got something to ask you. And he's like, hey, what's it, what is it? What's your big request here? What's going on? Um, and this is actually the third time the king has asked this question of Esther. It's happened a couple more times before, uh, chapter seven, 6 and chapter 7 has a couple of times on here. Um, but Esther answers back to this, what is your request with this weird statement? She's the queen and says, if I have found favour in your eyes, if I have found favour in your eyes, king, as your queen, um, so... Yeah, so verse 3 here, then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it pleases the king. So she's saying basically, God, yeah, King Xerxes, um, if it finds good to you, if it sounds good to you, then, then this is the question, this is my request to you, if. So Esther strategically negotiates with the king, uh, using his own uh, opinion of her as part of, uh, as part of the bargain. You see here, his response um, what is thy petition, uh, Queen Esther, and it shall be granted thee, and what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to half of the kingdom. So before she's even requested anything, he's like, what is it? Let me know, and I'll give you half the kingdom for it to be a part. So it'll go to all, all these people before he even knows what it is. And it's kind of a funny thing, because you think a petition is a wish, it's a request, um, and Esther answers a king with two, a twofold request. She first petitions the king for her own life to be spared. Okay, um, and it says here, so in verse 4, for we are sold, I and my people. So now she's saying, These, I'm, I'm part of this group that's going to get destroyed. Right? If we're sold, I wouldn't have said anything. If we're turned into slaves, I wouldn't have said anything. But actually, we're going to get destroyed, so I have to say something. But she says, I and my people. So basically, she's going, hey king, I've heard you say, okay, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the request to at least half the kingdom here. And she's basically saying, save me, save my people. And the king's probably kind of like thinking right now, what? Well, what's going on with you and your people? I don't know that you, these are part of your people, you're part of this people group. Um, but the great thing is, he says, what is your petition? What's your request? What's going on, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you, and what is your request? Up to half the kingdom will feel the benefits or the actions following this request. It shall be done. Again, the king hasn't even heard Esther's request yet, but it shall be granted to you. And if that isn't a good enough response, to so even know, like, before, imagine coming up to your parents and being like, hey, mom, hey, dad, and they're like, Hold on, guys, before you even say anything, it's going to be granted. I would change my request. I'm like, I want a bigger TV in my room. <laughs> like, I know what I was going to say before, and I was like, can I have some pocket money? But now I'm like, well, you're going to say yes, so I'm going to say, like, I want the new Xbox. You know, whatever. Because <laughs> I know you're going to say yes now. So Esther doesn't change 
her request. She still wants to be saved. She still wants her people to be saved. So actually, to know that she's not being selfish here, she's looking out for people and, and, and her people around her, herself and her people around her, that's a big deal. Let my life be given at my petition. Like, you can take my life, but please do what I'm asking. I, I will die if it means this will happen. That's kind of what they're saying. So Esther, even when she finally made her request, showed great tactical knowledge or understanding by saying, actually, even if you don't request, even if you don't grant the whole request, I will happily die so that this thing can go through. I'll put myself in a position of, of, of danger so that this will come through. And she hadn't really identified herself as a Jew yet, specifically. But now she's saying, I'm in that group that's targeted to get destroyed, to get massacred. Mm. And Haman, remember, in, in the third or second chapter, I think it's the third chapter, um, hid the identity of the group that he's trying to kill from the king. When he asked for the king's request, when he asked for the seal of the king, when he asked for his big decree to be put into play, he actually didn't tell the king who was doing all the damage or who that people group was. That's in Esther 3, verse 8. But he says, basically, there's this big group of people, and they're kind of they're planning to come against you. They're not following your rules. They're not really wanting to be part of your kingdom, and they might break away and do some damage. So we need to get rid of them. And actually, that's pretty pretty tricky. Haman's playing a trick right there. But Esther also framed, uh, showed wisdom in how she framed her request. She appealed on a personal basis. I, right? Uh, me first. Like, look at this and he saved me. Knowing that she has never done anything but please the king. She never was really pushed away from it. Like, he, she didn't find favor in him right at the start. Remember when she said, I haven't even been in front of the king for 30 days now? This hasn't been normal. This isn't the thing that's going on. But we can actually see that she is coming to the king personally with, with, as king, not just as husband, but as royal leader, saying, I'm willing to sacrifice if this goes through. I'm willing to do something so that it actually goes through well. And then she says in verse 4 that there are things that Esther would have done if stuff had happened, she would have kept quiet about. If they were been sold into slavery, she would have been fine with them. Because they would have still been alive. Right? But the fact that it's being destroyed and being massacred, that's a big issue here. So basically, Haman had put this decree through. We know this, chapter, uh, chapter 3. Haman's big decree being sent across the whole kingdom. Destroy the Jews, get rid of the Jews. We're going to pay people to get rid of them as well. And they're going to be rich because they got alongside what we're doing here in the plan. That's Esther 3, verse 9. And Esther's turning around saying, actually, if we were being sold, that would have been fine. Because they know what it's like to be sold. They know what happened in the Old Time, in the Old Testament, in Genesis and Exodus about being slaves, about people being uh, used to build stuff, being sold was a lot better than being destroyed. But she says um, in verse 4 here, For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. She doesn't say we're being sold into slavery. She's saying Haman's going to pay people to kill us all. You need to work this out, king. You need to work it out, because actually, what's happening here is a massacre. It's not, it's not work, it's not trade, it's anything, it's destruction. To be destroyed and killed, or to be annihilated. The same words used in the king's decree before. Hey, we'll come alongside and help kill these people, and you'll get paid for it. Destroy this people group, and you'll get rich off of it. And this is public information. We know that because there's been signposts everywhere, all across the whole kingdom taken by forces here, there, and everywhere. But it's just strange that the king is unaware of just how public this information is. And there's this repetition, this over and over and over nature of the decree, emphasizing how severe, how severe it is for the Jews and how they're going to end up massacred, destroyed, killed, and everyone who does it, everyone who does it, you're going to get rich. You're going to get rich. Haman's plan, tricking the king, bringing him to submission to, to give him the royal seal, was to basically commit genocide against the Jews. We've already read this. We already went through this in chapter 3. But it's really important that we remember and we look back about why we're in this situation now. If we were going to be sold 
I would not have said anything. That's what Esther says. And it's incredible because you think what strength she has to say, if we've been sold for bond men and bond women, I would have I had held my tongue. If that was going to happen, I would have kept quiet. Because she knew that she would still have a life. Not a very good life. A slave's life isn't very good, but she would have still been able to breathe. The Jews knew what it was like to be slaves. We can read that first five books of the Bible. Exodus, big deal, right? And what they <laughs> what they're leaving over? Being slaves, right? So, we come from the first four verses of Ruth coming up with this petition, the second banquet, having Haman and the king right there, and she's saying, listen to me, listen to what this guy's going to do to us, me and my people. And the king's like, oh, I just thought we were going to be drinking some wine, having a nice little banquet, I thought we were going to be celebrating how good I am. And she's like, oh, I've, got a, I've got something I need to talk to you. So we get to the second section here, which is just one single verse. Verse 5, the king's reaction. Do you want to read verse 5? Oh, uh, yeah. Please. Oh, then the king... What's that? Xerxes. Oh, I thought it was a Z. Yeah. Is it with a Z? Go for it. Xerxes? Oh, okay. Uh, then the king Xerxes answered and said unto oh. the king, Who is he and where is he that durst pursue in his heart to do so? Who is he? Where is he? Thanks, buddy. Thanks for reading. But who is he and where is he? What a reaction from the king, right? What has happened in this man's heart for him to plan to do this stuff? Esther's just given this whole background of what's going to happen. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. They're going to wipe people out. You're going to pay them to do it. It's coming out of your treasury, king. He's got this whole plan to, uh, fixed up. And what if he said? You said, yeah, here's the royal seal. Sign off on it. That's my signature. Let's do this. Let's wipe out all these people. Well, guess what? Those people are my people. They're my people. And I'm going to be part of that. And I'm going to die. And they're going to die. And it's all going to be under the royal signature. The royal seal. The stamp of approval from the king. And you're just okay with that. So here I am petitioning my life in place of all these others if I need it to happen that way. And the king's reaction, who did this? Who is this guy? Where is this guy? The funniest part of this is think about who is in the banquet hall right now. The king, Esther, and Haman. <laughs> who is this guy? And she's like, <clears throat> ah, and he sat right next to you. <laughs> Haman's kind of, yeah, must have been kind of all shaky and all anxious and all nervous and kind of, ah, something bad's going to happen. But you know what? The king's reaction kind of gives him a little bit of a tough guy look. Who is this guy? Where is he? Let's go get him. Who's planning on killing my queen and her people? Who's doing this? Who is so bold to try to do such a thing that their heart could be filled with such wickedness? Who could be so daring to try and do this? Xerxes is amazed at the wickedness. But remember, he's guilty of this as well. He handed over that ring. He handed over that signet ring to sign off on everything. He's part of this. As much as he might want to shovel the blame onto someone else and be like, I don't remember. I do paperwork every day. I don't know what I signed. <laughs> you gave him your ring. <laughs> you physically handed it over to the guy and said, do it. Do what you want. This sounds great. Let's have a drink over it. You can read that in the chapters before, but it's amazing to think that the king doesn't think of it that way. Or maybe he forgot it. I don't know. But the king consented, gave his royal seal of approval to Haman, and with that, Haman planned out the destruction of the Jews. That's crazy. Xerxes would have had to know that it was actually he who authorized Haman's plan to exterminate the Jews. He was the one who gave authorization in Esther 3, verses 10 to 11. But we can read that he did it in ignorance. He kind of gave it over and was like, yeah, sure. And we also can read that Haman doesn't say, we're going to kill these people. He says, there is a people group. There is a group of people that I'm not going to identify in case it's close to your heart, but I need them gone. Haman's tricking him. Haman's smart. I'm not smart enough. <laughs> right? So the king was quite irresponsible when it came to the rules and just 
allowing things, accepting things, because we see what it did there. And he trusted others. But once he found out something huge like this was going to happen, something was going to go down against this queen, he jumps into action. And sometimes we cannot believe that we've been tricked, right? Personally, we cannot believe that we've been tricked, especially by people who we have put in powerful positions. Okay, sometimes we can think about uh, people above us who we help elevate, who we help build up, and we go, wow, this person's going to be great for the job, and suddenly they're terrible at the job. Uh, That's happened before. Actually, excuse you, because I don't know how to say that. But uh, this happened before with, with young people, and I've said, hey, you should lead worship. And then suddenly their ego goes crazy, and they start using it as a position over all the other young people. And, oh, I'm so good because I help lead worship. And you go, whoa, what happened here? I trusted you with a position, and now you're abusing it? That's crazy. But it happens. It happens. So let's think here. We're in the banquet hall. It's Esther. It's the king. There's Haman. Haman has just finished leading Mordecai on horseback through the streets of the city, proclaiming before him, Here he comes, the most magnificent Mordecai, dressed in the king's clothes, a horse with a crown on it, all of, the, all of the bling, all of the good, all the amazing that Haman wanted for himself is now being put upon Mordecai and saying, this guy, this guy needs to be praised. So he left that situation, it says he ran away and covered his head and got out of there as fast as possible because he was ashamed. And then he went into the banquet with the king and the queen. And he sat there and he's hearing Queen Esther's petition, and he's probably thinking, man, I've had a rough day. I just want to go to a banquet, banquet of wine and just relax. Sit back with my buddy the king. He thinks I'm the best. We'll chat to Esther. She's all right. But I'm really here to butter up to the king a little bit more. I've got a couple more decrees to get through, maybe. But now he's in a situation where the king is the judge about whether he lives or dies. The king's in control here about what's going to happen. The queen, Queen Esther, is the prosecutor. She's running this courtroom and she's saying, this guy is guilty, guilty, guilty. Get rid of him. And then inside Haman, we're going to read in a second, his conscience starts playing a little bit. His heart starts talking to him a little bit. And that was the witness against him. You've got the king as the judge, the queen as prosecutor, Haman's own being as a key witness about what he's just done. <laughs> the joy of being invited to a banquet of wine quickly fell away as Haman realized what was going on. <laughs> what? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me if he's not shaking. Right? So we're going to look at the third section right here, verse 6. Who would like to read verse 6? Do you want to go for that? Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> And Esther said the adversary. 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 An enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and queen. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, we have this question from the king Who is he? Where is he? What's going on? <laughs> What's happened here? And Esther turns around and says, like, here he is. Here he is right here. The adversary you're talking about, the guilty party, the person to point to, he's sat right here. He's drinking wine with you right now. He's your good buddy. He's the one that you promoted. It is Haman. It is Haman. Verse 6, Esther identifies the guilty party. The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Esther exposed the truth about Haman that he was not a faithful servant of the king. He was instead an adversary, an enemy against the king, more interested in his own fame and status than the benefit of the king. And we know that because what was he doing just in the chapter before? When the king says, hey, I want to think of a reward. He's like, a reward for me? He wasn't thinking about how the king could look after his people and bless other people. He's thinking, me, 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 look how good I am. We can see that he's not a good servant to the king. He got frustrated when Mordecai didn't bow down to who? Him. He's not the king. But he was frustrated that you didn't bow down to him. 
So it says here, Haman was afraid before king and queen, terrified, anxious, nervous. No, afraid. He's scared. He's scared. Now, I'd like to think Haman never imagined that Esther was a Jew. Right? I'd like to think he didn't think that she was a Jew or didn't know that she was a Jew, but it doesn't say anything about that. Okay? But now he stood there before the king being rightly accused of plotting the murder of the king's wife and all of her people. And you're like, wow, this, this banquet's just gone real dramatic. Things have gone downhill real fast. <laughs> Escalated real quickly, yeah. And now the wisdom of Esther's strange request to invite Haman to these banquets can be seen. She's invited him in, not in a public setting, in a private setting. It's wise, because you know what? If she did it in public, there'd be a lot more voices. There'd be a lot more interactions, a lot, a lot more opinions that she'd have to kind of talk through. In this situation, it's her, it's the king, it's him. It's private. And yeah, there'll be servants. There'll be servants walking around and, and servers like bringing them food and topping up their wine and doing all that stuff. But you know what? They're not going to voice anything. Because they're not in that position. They're going to be quiet. They're going to be real quiet. They'll probably be sitting there like pouring the wine. It's overflowing from the glass. It's like, what's going on here? <laughs> they're getting a scoop. <laughs> but they're not going to say anything. Esther's really wise. A second banquet is a really good idea. It maximized the impact of this whole situation between the king and Haman himself. So, we could, uh, we could be looking at this and thinking, man, Haman's getting a real short straw here. But let's remember, let's run through how Haman got to this position. Because actually, there's a lot of, oh man, I feel really bad for him. No, no, let's, let's go. Uh, let's read through and think, uh, man, Haman might be getting the rough end of the stick. But we can read in Esther chapter 3 all about Haman's plan. After he gets promoted by King Xerxes, that he saw Mordecai and saw that he did not bow to him. That's the first thing that happens here. King points him, says, hey, you're promoted. Boop, 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 boop. Comes up, he's got a lot of power. And he comes out and he's like, look at me, you're all my power. And then there's one person not bowing down, and he's like, you, I'm gonna get really angry now. I'm gonna get really angry. He surrounded himself with, with bad people who spoke to him daily about the fact that Mordecai did not bow down to him. That's chapter three, verse four. Think about that. Think about, you're in school, someone bumps you in the shoulder, and you're like, ah! Oh! The rest of the day, you're like, oh, I'm really frustrated with that. And then you come to school the next day, and your friends are like, hey, remember when that guy bumped you in the shoulder? And you're like, oh, yeah, actually, I'm really frustrated about that stuff. And then the next day, hey, remember that guy bumped you in the shoulder? Oh, yeah, and then I saw this, and they start adding stuff to it. That's what happens. They escalate that whole scene. They blow it out of proportion, and suddenly you're there going, it wasn't just a bump on the shoulder, it was a rude word. It was a curse towards your family. He wants to steal your stuff, he wants you dead, all this stuff. And then suddenly, boom, big explosion. Haman's angry. Verse 5, and when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then Haman was full of wrath. Verse 6, Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom. He went from anger to wrath. Let's boop, 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 next level. And then he went from next level wrath to let's destroy everyone who's connected to this guy in the whole kingdom. That's kind of taken up a couple more steps. This is crazy. Verse 8 and 9, Haman goes to the king and brings a plan that will destroy all Jews. Trickery and craftiness from Haman. Again, doesn't mention that they're Jews. Just says these people. King hands over the king's royal seal, the signet ring, and lets the plan go ahead. At the end of chapter 3, Haman and the king sit down, probably on their balcony, overlooking the city, cheersing each other with glasses of wine, thinking about how great they are, whilst the city are confused by what has just been agreed upon. And we can read from this point onwards that Haman brags to his family about all his riches, about his sons, about his wealthiness, about his position. He gets real angry, he enjoys food, just plots the destruction of the Jews, he does all these amazing things that aren't so amazing. But in his mind, he's the big deal. Haman tries to get a huge reward from the king for doing such a good job. 
And then here we are, after he's just led Mordecai around doing that exact reward that he wanted. We're back in the banquet hall with the king, with the queen, and with guilty Haman. Section 4, verses 7 and 8. Scott, do you mind reading that? Seven and eight. Please. And the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in this house? As the words went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. So verses 7 and 8, subsection 4 here, Haman's wretched end. We see the kind of end of this whole discussion coming out now. The king stood up, left the banquet of wine in anger, in wrath. You know what's really wise? What's actually really wise about this situation? The king does something really wise. He doesn't just run over to Haman and sock him in the mouth and lay him out and be like, Rah! How could you do this? Instead, he stands up and he walks out. Sometimes that's something really important to think about. When next time you guys are angry and you're all frustrated and you're fired up and you're ready to go and get in someone's face, rah, the king actually does something really good. He stands up, he get, walks away from the situation. I don't know what he thinks about. It doesn't tell us in the Bible what he thinks about, but he says he left that place and he went into the gardens. And Haman saw his opportunity to make a final request to the queen, to Esther, to save his life, as he recognized that his plans collapsing all around him, all these pillars that he put in place are all crumbling down. And he saw that there was evil, that the king was determined to see him and killed for what he did. That's really interesting. Because it tells you that Haman recognizes aggression, anger, evil. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. He saw that the tides were turning. Mm -hmm. He saw that his time was running out. Mm -hmm. And the king returned to the, to the place of the banquet. And Haman had fallen on the bed where Esther was. And the king saw this and said, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? Now we need to remember that this isn't a normal bed. Right? This isn't a bed that we sleep in. King size bed, anything like that. No. This is like a little couch. A layout couch type of situation. Because whilst people would be banqueting, whilst they'd be eating and drinking wine, they'd be laying down. They'd be reclining out. It's kind of a nice lifestyle to have, you know? In different commentaries, though, it says, and I read quite a few of these, that Haman had fallen to Esther's knees. That she was reclining on the couch, and he had fallen on the end of the bed there, was holding onto her knees in desperation. And that was a form of saying, I am lower than you. You may be laying down and reclining, but I'm going to grab your knees here and say, please, please, please don't kill me. Please save my life. Begging her to save his life. Will he attempt to convince the queen to change her mind, just like he was trying to wipe out the whole people? Will he really try and do this? Yeah, he will. He will, Shiraz. Sure the king leaves with Haman at the banquet and comes into him groveling to Esther. Groveling. And the king arose in his wrath. The king was filled with anger or wrath, uh, probably because he now realized that Haman had played him for a fool. How's it going? What does groveling mean? To be like down on your knees. And you're so lovely, Haman. Oh, right? Okay. Yeah, like begging. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So Haman had just played the king for a fool getting this decree signed to kill the Jews. There was evil trickery that had his signature all over it. And I can understand that. I don't know if you guys have been, ever been played as a fool before, or been tricked into something before. You get frustrated. You're angry. I'm like, how can you try and do this to me? I thought we were friends. I thought we were family. I thought we were good. What's going on? And here he is. He's saying, oh, you tricked me. You made me look like an idiot. You tried to wipe out my queen. You tried to wipe out my queen's people. And here you are groveling to her? You were just trying to kill her. It's justifiable, I guess. It's not good, but <laughs> you know. 
Will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house for all of Haman's pleading? All of it. On his knees, grabbing the knees. <laughs> please, 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 please. He only got himself into deeper trouble. Mm -hmm. Put his hands on the queen. He put his hands on the queen. <laughs> It's a big, yeah, that's exactly what my note says. That is like, you come into the king's presence, you come into the king's presence, what happens? You're dead. You touch him, one of the queens of the king, you're touching one of the king's ladies? Did you ask for permission? <laughs> nope. Should you be doing that? Nope. Is it inappropriate? Yes. Aren't there laws and rules that you should be going? Hey, when you know this stuff, right? But guess what? You did it anyway, and now you're in trouble. Now you just sealed your own fate. Hey, maybe get that ring that I gave you and just stab this one, please. I don't know. And as he said it, as the king said those words, the servants in the room covered Haman's face. Haman's head was covered as a preparation for execution. That's what people would do. Haman's face was covered also so that the king wouldn't have to see the offender's face anymore. I'm disgraced by I don't want to see you again. Get out of my sight. I don't want to see your face anymore. But let's think about what's going to happen next. In Esther 5, chapter 5, verse 14, it tells us of this idea of this huge, tall gallows to be constructed so that Mordecai could be executed on them. And this thought pleased Haman, so he had it done, so he had it made. Now fast forward two chapters and we are here with Haman ready to be destroyed by the very tool that he had made to kill, to kill Mordecai. There's no discussion of Mordecai here, by the way. Haman's not like, hey, you, this is all about Mordecai. It wasn't about you, it's about Mordecai. It's, it's kind of crazy. It seems like Mordecai is kind of a second thought. He's panicked. And we're here with Haman with his head cut. As a criminal, unworthy to look on the face of the king. The servants, as the king spoke those words, covered the face of Haman, blocking out the light, and with that, the sentence of death was upon him. We're in our final section here, verses 9 and 10. I'll read those out. <clears throat> and uh, and Harbani, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows. 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang them him thereon. Verse 10, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. So verses 9 and 10, section 5 here, the execution of Haman. Look! The gallows that Haman had constructed, super tall, 50 cubits high. <laughs> really hard to miss. <laughs> Pretty awkward garden decorated right there. <laughs> like, that's really nice. What is it? It's a gallows. Someone's going to die on it soon. How's it going? How tall would 50 cubits be? 75. Uh, say, there's 75 feet. So when they did the measurements of the arc, they used cubits as well, and they are able to kind of work that all out. Um, 75 feet. That's really that's like, so when we say kind of awkward garden decoration, it's like this one thing huge in the air right there. Was it like a tree or was it like a stick? What do you think? Tree? They were like throwing yeah. person out there, wasn't it? Yeah, I've got a picture that's coming up real soon um, of a bronze design basically of Haman being impaled on the stake. It doesn't show real how, how high it was, but basically mm -hmm. impalement. Pushed on. So it was a tree? Huh? Yeah. Big hole, uh, what do they call it? They call it um, a pointed pole. pointed pole. A pointed pole. Just standing up from the ground. You know, a real tall tree. Shave that thing up, make it nice and pointy. Great. Who fess? I thought it was a noose. Hmm? Noose is one really hard one. noose. So gallows are now called that. But this is this, this is the same, same name, but actually it wasn't a thing back then. So it was death by impalement. Mm -hmm. Basically. Dracula. Mm -hmm. Death by Impalement. Actually, uh, <laughs> Scott touched on that, I think, was it last week or week before that? Yeah, on both. Well, there you go. So, but last week, there, uh, it's Esther chapter 6. Um, you can see the pictures that you put up there of, of what they would have looked like. And it's just this big stake in the ground. But think of that 75 feet high, and the person just put on there and left to just be. 
You're not getting that person down afterwards. They're just going to be there for a long time. So you don't die fast. No, it's, it's real rough. And we can see that the impalement was just a rough, rough death. So, there's this picture. You see right here, it's the king. And here is a guy being impaled by this big stick. Right? We can see that there's people watching, there's people looking all over, and this is what's going to go on right now. Haman's going to be impaled with this big stick. Is this going to be like that? Is this your idea of judgment on the Jews? You're going to have that on yourself now. And the king ordered it, and it's just, it's gruesome. It's gruesome. The psalmist, uh, so Psalms, we're going to look at Psalm 7, um, warns us against wicked folk. What the wicked bring it. So 7, 14 to 16, yeah. Behold, he tra travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. What was Haman doing right at the start? This is really important, and we can line this up with Esther. Haman was bringing forth mischief, trickery, not giving the full facts, lying, bringing falsehood to the king, saying, these people are dangerous. Well, were they? Had they done anything dangerous? Were they going against the king? Trickery. He didn't even say who he was going against. They're just bad. They're the bad guys. Those people over there are horrible. Well, which ones? Well, those guys. That's trying to trick the king into thinking, actually, this is a bigger deal than it is. Verse 15. He made a pit and rigged it and has fallen in the ditch which he made. He ordered the gallows to be made. He had the idea and was like, I like it. He rigged it. He made it up. And you know what? He ended up on it. He fell into that ditch. Verse 16. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own head. That also can be um, said as crown. Okay, so his position. Okay. Basically, he had it coming to him. He shot himself in his own foot by the way he was acting. Right? Haman was the architect of these gallows, and here they were ready to help him meet his end because of wickedness, because of mischief, because of falsehood. We, we can see this being used in the Bible where the wicked set up something, but the righteous triumph instead of the intended end. Right? We're, we're really thankful, I'm super thankful, that the greatest example of all of this was when Satan thought, hey, I'm going to win by getting the crowd to crucify Jesus. I'm going to win by convincing them to get rid of this guy. But the cross turned out to be the instrument of Satan's defeat. He didn't know what he was doing when he sent Jesus to the cross, but Jesus knew that this is the way I'm going to win. So they hung Haman on the gallows, in which he had prepared just, there he is. He had prepared for Mordecai, and with that, the king's wrath subsided, pacified, went away. He was no longer angry. The death of the substitute satisfied the wrath of the king. There's a lot of things being crossed over here. In this case, it's the substitute for Mordecai was Haman. Haman's death satisfied that king. For us, the substitute of us is Jesus Christ. Innocent Jesus dying on the cross in the place of guilty mankind, satisfying the wrath of God. Genesis 50 verse 20 tells us this, But as for you, you fought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring it to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. We're going to read that. We can read context about Joseph saying, hey, you meant what you meant for evil, God used for good. When you sold me into slavery, God saved me and brought me all the way over here. I've been in prison. I've been accused of stuff. I've been a slave. I've been on all the down and the ditches, but God raised me up, and I'm here, and you meant, he meant it for good. You meant it for evil. He meant it for good. And in the same situation, Haman wanted to do evil with these gallows, with those decrees that God saved the Jews through this death machine. The guy against them all was taken out. Just like Jesus on the cross, 
Jesus went in our place, taking sin on his shoulders, went to the cross so that we didn't have to have that guilt and shame on us anymore. What the world made for evil, that cross, God made for the ultimate good and salvation. When we think about the seventh chapter of Esther, we can think about the cross over here of a substitute satisfying the wrath of God. Jesus going to the cross so that we don't have to. Jesus taking the sin on, our, on his shoulders so that we don't have to bear the weight of that. So that we can come in front of God and say, he died for me. He saved me. What you meant for evil, God made for good. So that on this day, many shall live. Through Jesus Christ, we can have salvation, eternal life in him. That's the best news that we can ever have. The best news. And that is the seventh chapter of Esther. So, anyone got any extra thoughts? Any other ideas? Anything they thought of while we were reading it? Anything? No. Shiraz, you got anything? Yeah. 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 Yes. Should be done. Okay. Got three final thoughts for you here then. So, the first one Are you walking around with your head cut? This sounds kind of funny because, you know, it's cold outside, we had snow, it's going to happen, we're going to put hats on, maybe we'll put a scarf around and you cover up your face quite a bit, but I'm not on about with clothes, I'm on about, are you walking around with condemnation on you? Are you condemned to death? Because Jesus has given you the gift of freedom through him, through his death on the cross, we have salvation if we choose to accept it. Are you walking around with your head covered? Because if you are, you shouldn't be. Okay? Live in the freedom of Jesus Christ. If you haven't made that decision, talk to us. We want to pray for you. But if you have, and you're walking around with your head covered in conviction and condemnation, and I'm just a horrible sinner, Jesus Christ died for that so that you can be free. So be free. Live free. Second one here, do you allow your emotions to run your life? Haman was proud, he was angry, he was boastful, he was full of fury, and then finally he was desperate, upset and afraid. Emotions, when allowed to run your life, are a dangerous, dangerous thing. When we realize that your emotions are a reaction to the situations you're going through, they really shouldn't be the thing that you rely on. You're allowing your emotions to run your life. Do you make snap decisions based on how you're feeling in the time? We can use the king as a great example here. If you're angry, stand up, walk away from the situation, and come back in when you're a little bit more cooled off. Obviously, we see what happened with Haman there, but the king actually does something pretty wise there. Don't let emotions run your life. Don't let your heart lead you in directions where God's saying, actually, I still need it. Okay? It's a reaction. So how personal reaction to something else that's going on. Emotions aren't going to get us to a good place. Following your heart is, is, a, is a treacherous area. The third point here is your faith in Jesus Christ. Brother Scott hammered Romans Rose a couple of times now in each of his teachings, and I really love it because you know what? Without knowing who Jesus is and without knowing what Jesus has done and without knowing what Jesus is going to continue doing for everyone in this world until he comes back. What are we believing in? What's our faith in? Are you believing in yourself? Are you believing in your own pride, your own doing, your own strength, your own works? That's not going to get you anywhere but the gallows. Is your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know that you're a sinner? Do you know that you need to be saved? Do you know that Jesus has paid that way for you so you can be saved? And have you accepted it? Because if you haven't, Consider it. Talk to Jesus. Ask him. Read the Bible. Read Romans. Understand what he's done for you.